Hey everybody, thanks for joining me on Yard Coach this week. I appreciate your attention as always. Hey, this week we are going to be discussing the inspection, maintenance, and occasional repair of your irrigation system. A very, very key component to landscape health is making sure that that irrigation system is always dialed into the nines. Are you with me? Glad you're here. Let's get started. So I thought it would be easiest if we broke this down in the simplest of terms, not only for uh, comprehension, but also for just digestion and maybe watching it more than once. Hey, if you haven't already, really consider subscribing to the channel. It's the cheapest free way of supporting me and Maestro as we do a great DIY landscape educational video series here on YouTube, and also on podcast. So, in our analytics, we notice that only about 50% of the people who are watching actually are subscribers. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and enjoy some great landscape education quality videos over the past two years plus. We are very, very proud of how much the channel has grown, and we look forward to future growth as we march forward. So, regarding irrigation inspection, maintenance, and repair, Let's break this thing down into about six key components of when you go out there and take a look at your system on a periodic but regular basis so that you know that thing is always dialed in and ready to go for the upcoming season or seasons. So we're gonna break it down into those six key components starting off with timers. Timers are the brains of the whole irrigation system if you choose to have it automated and done through an electrical system that goes from the timer to the valves, causing the valves to open and close electrically. Next ones are the wire. The wire that runs from such timers underground, under house, or wherever you go to the valves itself. Periodic inspection is very important. The next thing is those water delivering devices called pipes. And I'll guarantee you, you will know when the pipes are not in good service. Fourth one is valves. Valves can be both shut off, backflow prevention devices, and anti-siphon and inline valves for most residential irrigation systems. Connectors, connectors are those parts and pieces that we get on that aisle at the box store or other places that obviously put together the whole system. They connect the valves and the pipes. They connect the delivery spray heads and the drip irrigations all the parts and pieces, a very key component. And lastly, the spray heads themselves, the actual water delivering devices that come through the valves, through your pipes, and out the spray heads or the drip heads or the emitters and deliver water to your landscape in a rate and the correct amount to benefit and keep your landscape healthy. These key components are what we inspect, maintain and repair on a regular basis so that we can double, triple, and quadruple the life of our irrigation system. Whether it is a direct result from damage that we have to go in and repair, whether it is something that is worn out and needs to be replaced, or it's something that just father time, hard water, and the elements outside in your landscape take its toll, we have to periodically check in order to keep things at peak performance through the spring, summer, and fall months. And for some of you down in Florida, year round. A responsible homeowner, which I'm assuming I am talking to, and who gives two craps about the mega dollars they have invested into their home that they're raising their family and living in 365 days a year, should pay attention to the landscape that they own, the vehicles they own, the home that they own on a regular basis. It's not something that we just buy and forget. It's not something that we just install and forget about it. It's something that you have to go back on a regular basis. Imagine, imagine if you buy a $50,000 vehicle nowadays and you never change the oil. You never vacuum it, you never wash it, you never wax it. What's it gonna look like in 10 years or less? Kind of the same principle goes towards the irrigation system. 
Yeah, it's a lot of those out of sight, out of mind type of things, but it's also one of those things that if you don't pay attention to it, it tends to creep up on you and suddenly you got a ticket on your door from the water police or you have a neighbor going, you know your sprinklers are coming on six times a day? Those are the kinds of things that I have been experiencing over 20 plus years of landscape consultation and maintenance that people let things go. They just forget about them. As a rule of thumb, at least for uh, someone who's semi-conscientious regarding the irrigation system, twice a year checking, twice a year inspection, at a minimum, is the best way to know that you are maintaining your system correctly. For me personally, it was generally always four times a year. I checked it on the 21st in the change of each season because I knew coming up after that is going to be a change in weather, a change in temperatures, change in humidity, and a change in demand of the landscape itself in order to keep it healthy. So coming out of winter and doing it in springtime, that would be the inspection of the entire system. Timers, valves, spray heads, emitters, everything got checked. And then timers got kind of adjusted, which I'll cover here in just a second. Coming up in summer, generally it, it had to do with increasing times or frequency of watering to meet the demands of the hot Central Valley of California. In fall, when the days got shorter, things started to cool off. Again, you went out there and you looked at the timer and you dialed down the number of days you were watering, dialed down the number of minutes per zone because the landscape just did not require it. And then when the rainy season came in, oftentimes we would just turn the system off or turn it to the rain sensor. Occasionally in the Californian winters that we've experienced the last 15, 20 years, there were times where we had to turn the system on because we didn't have rain for four, six, seven weeks at a time, which was really unusual compared to when I was growing up. We had to turn that system on just to get some water in the ground again. Okay, let's start off with those six key components. Let's talk about timers in depth. The brains of that system that I spoke of earlier. You know, these are uh, much different than when I first started or was first exposed to landscape irrigation timers. Back then they were, electric, yes, but they were all gear driven and pin tripped, etc. from the old Rick Dell timers that were back in the 70s. Now, these things are electronic brains with little mini processors and computers in there that can actually hook up to Wi-Fi systems so you can program or reprogram your timers anywhere in the world that you have a Wi-Fi connection. Quite an advancement. But still, because it's a fine piece of electronics, you have to go out and take a look at it once in a while. Here's what I used to do. First, if it's outside, if it's outside, make sure that you have it in a waterproof box. The, the indoor timers, the ones that can go indoors in a shed or in the garage, are not meant for outside on the wall. They're not meant for that UV exposure, the heat, the cold, and the wet. So please, don't put an indoor timer outside. But you can put an outside timer indoors. There's no problem with that. But hey, let's focus in on the timer itself. We're gonna look at the electrical connections where those wires come up through the bottom. We're gonna make sure that all the toggle switches or the screws all are kind of snug. Not over tightened if they're the little toggles that you just put the wire into the slot and toggle the clamp down. There's nothing to do. Just a slight tug to see that everything is tight. On the common port, the common port, sometimes we have one, two, I've seen as many as three common wires go into that port. That is generally where I've seen problems happen. When you have too many wires into that common port and the, the tension on it does not connect really well. So make sure that works. Make sure you take a look at that battery, the backup battery. If your area where you live is prone to power outages, make sure that that backup battery is in good health. When we go to the, uh, the settings, make sure that your month, day, and year are still in good order. Then go to day of the week. Then go to your minutes and your watering days and make sure that everything is in line with what you're supposed to be watering. You people out in the Western US, you know what I'm talking about those on days, off days, make sure that those are in alignment 
and then make sure you know with whatever weather and whatever season is coming up, you have each zone appropriately timed. So the amount of water going there is doing the landscape a good solid and making sure that plenty of water is there. And lastly at the timer is hygiene and function. The function part of it is I'd like you to turn it to manual, a manual setting and run through each zone in your landscape. If you know that all the valves are coming on and going off according to what you want, say you did manual for one minute and you had somebody out at the valves or you went scurrying out there and checked to see that each valve operated correctly, two things just happened. Number one, the timer is sending milliamps to that solenoid. Number two, the solenoid on that valve is solid and a bonus three, you know that your wires are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And as far as the hygiene goes, the exterior box can get wiped down, get rid of the dust and the collection of gunk that happens, and then go inside and what I used to use is canned air. And I would just kind of blow dust and particles, get rid of any spee spideys that want to crawl up in there, earwigs, other things. I've seen webs, I've seen wasp nests uh, up in there. And you make sure all those things are cleaned out and taken care of. And then wiped out as much as you can. And don't forget that battery. All right, moving on to that second key component. And that's the wire. Remember, I gave you a three for just a minute ago. If you're testing the timer and sending a signal to the valve just to come on for a minute or so, you know your wire is going to be good. We've already checked the wires in the timer itself. We've determined those are okay. They're nice and snug. They're screwed in or they're toggled in really well. Now go out to the valves. Look at that valve bundle of wires. Does everything still look tight and consistent? Look at the wires, the two wires that come out of the solenoid. Make sure that they still look in good shape and not one is broken or cut or whatever. If you have that, that valve ain't coming on, at least electrically. If all these wires seem to be in good shape, then you are done with the wire part. Moving on, let's talk about the valves. The valves, just like the timer, are the workhorses of your irrigation system. You have backflow prevention device valves, like uh, vacuum breakers and double check valves. You have shutoff valves before the valve system and maybe where you've connected into your mainstream. All of these valves, including the inline and anti-siphon valves, are very important and, if not correctly inspected and maintained, can go south on you in a hurry. The anti-siphon valves particularly, they have components inside that have little springs and diaphragms and little magnetos in and around and below the um, solenoid that activate the valve to create a vacuum in there. If you have really hard water, or a combination of hard and iron type of water, this can cause uh, calcium buildups and sediments and stuff that can cause that diaphragm not to close and open correctly. A really key indicator is when your valve does not shut down fairly quickly. Most valves should shut off electrically within five seconds. Most valves manual operated should shut off within 15 seconds. And if they're not, you may have a little debris in there that you're going to have to turn off your system and undo those screws or undo that jelly jar type of valve and go in and look at it and clean it out. If for some reason you get a worn spring or a rubber diaphragm that has for some reason got a, a little nick or a cut or something in it, they're easy to replace. Just turn off your system, disassemble the valve, clean the old part and inspect it and replace it if those parts look broken. To check the manual operation of the valve, there's usually a handle. There's usually a small handle that is kind of sleeved over the top of the solenoid. And there's the bleeder screw, which I'll talk about in a minute. But by turning it on at the solenoid handle, you'll see an, an instant rush of water and your system will go on. Once it goes on, let it run for 15 seconds and then slowly turn it back off. Do not ratchet it down hard. It just needs to go off with barely hand tight at all and until the valve closes down. If you're using the bleeder screw and you undo that, you're going to get a trickle of water coming up out of there. You've basically broken the vacuum in that valve and your system is going to come on as well. Turn that bleeder screw back closed until there's no more water 
but don't ratchet it down really hard. One of the biggest things I see people do is in older valves, they take a screwdriver and they tighten it down. Now, plastic against plastic, especially older plastic, is gonna break. And once you break that, you, it's very hard to get that thing out. I've had to replace valves just because of a bleeder screw. So be careful, just barely hand tight is all it takes. Okay, so much for valves. Let's move on to pipe. The pipe system, you're gonna know if that pipe system is not sound. You're gonna know from geysers, flooding, uh, blowouts, etc. If everything seems to be good and you do have an underground system, there's not a lot of inspection that you can do. Uh, you can inspect things at the valve assembly itself, the pipe system. Uh, especially if you didn't winterize in time or you're in a zone that had a weird freeze and frost warning and it got a crack in it and now you have a leak come spring and summertime. Then you're going to have to address it. The piping system, if you have to go in and repair it, it's basically a tedious task, but done right, you should have to only do it once. A little bit of digging, a little bit of exposure of the area, sometimes more exposure than you expect, determine what you need to have as far as parts and pieces, and then do a plan and do it. Measure twice and cut once. Great, great philosophy. I generally used to measure probably two, three, and four times, especially if I was dealing with a pipe bundle that had a problem on an underside pipe. Then you have to be very, very careful in your measuring. The piping system, both poly pipe and PVC pipe, are all based on good repair and good installation practices. It really, really helps. It really helps if you know those good gluing and screwing type of practices, especially with poly pipe and the, the ring clamps and other things that go along with it. Don't over tighten, don't over glue because you really don't have to. Always remember to use primer on PVC and then just, the, just a little bit of glue is all you need. I see people dollop glue on there like one, two dips in the can. You don't need to do that. All it does is prolong your curing time and it doesn't make a better joint. It really doesn't. Most pipe breakages sometimes will involve um, a joint of some kind. Maybe a sprinkler head or a sprinkler riser got hit uh, for whatever reason and it has broken it off down underground at the pipe. Maybe the, the, the T or maybe the L has been broken and you're gonna to have to get down in there, cut it, reassemble and re-glue it in place. Again, just good gluing practices. Most, most of the black and green poly pipe, they're fairly easy to repair. They're not so much a, a gluing practice as they are a cutting practice. And I strongly urge you to invest in a couple of great PVC pipe cutting tools as well as poly pipe cutting tools. One is put out by the Victor company and the other one is listed right here. Okay, moving on, we're talking about spray heads. Spray heads are, uh, they're also a workhorse because they're your water delivering devices to the landscape itself. We're gonna talk about lawn heads first. Lawn heads suffer damage as well as wear out quite a bit. Uh, the nozzles and the, the sprinkler head body are generally the biggest culprits of failure. We'll talk about spray heads first. The ones that pop up out of the ground, deliver their water through the nozzle and then retract back down. Those spray heads, the nozzle is generally the culprit. Uh, Sometimes the springs wear out inside the, bot, the body or the case, but most of the time it's the nozzle and the white wiper seal or black wiper seal. Those tend to wear out over time. I've seen a lot of the nozzle problems from uh, string trimmers, uh, the old rotary bladed belt driven edgers, uh, even improper placement of the sprinkler head and you get mower strikes that hit them very easy to replace and repair. I always suggest during installation that you use a swing arm assembly. The swing arm basically is a small insurance policy that something hits it and tends to bend rather than break. And it really is a great, great tool. 
always use like six inch swing arm assemblies for lawn heads. I don't suggest them that much for planting bed, but if you do, it's not gonna hurt anything. Anyway, back to nozzles. Nozzles are easy. A couple of tools that you might wanna consider here is the pop-up pliers. Rainbird puts one out, and they're great for holding that, that uh, pop-up barrel in place while you're doing two-handed work, rather than pulling it up, holding it with one hand, and trying to do everything one-handed. Try looking for those things as well. If you're dealing with rotor heads, you might want to invest in one of the screwdrivers, and most of the time they are supplied with the sprinkler if you buy a case. Uh, you will get one, but if not, they're easily attainable. And they're easy because you can put them into the slots of the head of the rotor and be able to pull it up or adjust it or diffuse it, do all kinds of things. It's better than having just a small flathead screwdriver. It really is. The biggest failure in rotor heads and pop-ups and canister impact heads is the nozzles and also the uh, encroachment, the encroachment of the turf itself. It'll sometimes almost overgrow the sprinkler itself if you don't pay attention to it. So once a year, sometimes twice a year, depending on how aggressive your lawn is, go out there with a, a good old paring knife or a linoleum knife, keep it really sharp, and gently just cut a small little circle around each head. Keep that clear and allow that pop-up or that rotor to pop up and do its thing or the canister head to not be encumbered by the lawn it's trying to water. Very important. Pop-up heads are also very susceptible to bugs, especially in the drier climates. Bugs will crawl up in there and they will bury their heads in to get a drink and then they get stuck and clog the head. Many, many times, especially the old brass shrub nozzles. Those were really, really, very susceptible to bug infestation. And you had to have a little tool or a, a, a small plier and you had to undo the top of that nozzle and clean it out and blow it out, get rid of the bug that's in there and put it back on. That's why a lot of times if you put uh, spray heads in planting beds, don't use that brass nozzle any longer because you're just asking for more maintenance. You really are. Okay, moving on, parts and pieces, parts and pieces. Hey, whether it be PVC or plastic or poly pipe, whatever they are, these guys are the, the, the bones of the system. They put it all together for you so it works according to plan, it really does. Those parts and pieces are easily replaced. It comes back to measuring, cutting, good gluing practices, good clamping practices, using the barbed fittings for the poly pipes. All of these things are easily attainable at the hardware store. Remember this, the best insurance to make sure that you're not fixing everything all the time is to put it in right the first time. The first time. Mostly you won't have to maintain it unless it gets damaged. Maybe you have a shovel or a pick strike, something like that. Those are probably the most common. The other thing is, is when it comes to the parts and pieces and the pipe itself, go with the heavy walled pipe. Most parts and pieces for PVC are Schedule 40 anyway, but the pipe can either be Class 200 or Schedule 40, some even Schedule 80, but that's generally not necessary. But don't use the thin walled pipe on pressurized sides of the valve or your watering system. Use the thick walled pipe. It can generally stand up to at least one strike without breaking, but it too will shatter if you're digging a tree and you forgot the pipe is there and you're digging a tree hole, yep, chances are you're gonna shatter it. Remember, no over tightening, good gluing practices, good design and plan. And if you don't know how to design your irrigation system, remember last week and two weeks ago, put a link right here for you to check that out because your plan, when it comes to life, if done correctly, is the greatest way to minimize maintenance and repairs down the road. Remember, spending a little bit of time, and we're only talking 15 minutes or less, a couple times a year, and if you have repairs, yeah, you gotta run to the store and get a part or whatever, but spending a little bit of time is going to 2x, 4x, 10x the functional lifetime of your irrigation system. 
It is a key element of maintaining a healthy landscape, so make sure you pay attention to it. Lastly, for you cold weather people, especially newbies in the cold weather areas, don't forget to blow out your irrigation system in the fall. Make sure that you have plenty of moisture in the ground right before you do it, and then go ahead and have somebody do it, or you can watch several videos on YouTube here that'll tell you exactly how to do it. Some require professional tools, other stuff you have around your house, a compressor, you know, air hose, etc. You can blow it out yourself. So there you go, a simple approach to your very important automated or manual irrigation system. Take care of it, just like you do your house, your cars, your kids, your clothes, everything. It is an expensive, expensive part of your landscape maintenance. So pay attention to it. Hey, if you're interested, check me out next week because I'm gonna do the same type of inspection, maintenance and repair for low voltage lighting. Maybe that applies to you. Or maybe you're thinking about putting one in. I hope you tune in at that time. Hey, as always to your landscape success, if you're thinking about putting in an irrigation system, you might wanna check out my website. I've got great detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to put an irrigation system in, both in the digital course and the ebook. Don't forget that 15-step giveaway. Thank you for your time as always. I'll catch you guys next week. Plan of the week is here as well, and I hope you'll take a look at some of the other educational videos I have to offer. Don't forget to subscribe. Until next week, bye for now. Hey, as a little relaxation bonus, and since we're on the topic of water, hey, enjoy the Wise River here in the Pioneer Mountains of Montana. It's just a little outro that I thought you might enjoy.